completing my Bachelor of Science degree at Vancouver Island University, just up the road a little ways in Nanaimo. And um, I decided to go to Africa last summer to do some volunteering and to do some teaching and see the country a little bit, uh, Kenya particularly. And so I ended up going to Kamuka Primary School. This is a picture of uh, the main office there. And um, just wanted to help out the school. And when I got there, I had a few concerns. Um, one was that obtaining an education was very difficult, and I'll explain why. So they desperately needed help. Um, this is their library. There are probably less than 100 books there, probably like 50. Um, it's pretty sad. This is just built a couple years ago, and the shelves are very bare. Um, and most of them are very outdated, and they're pretty worn, so the kids aren't getting very much use out of that. Um, the other concern was their notebooks as well. Uh, their notebooks were covered in paper just to protect them because it's very dusty and very dirty there. Most kids don't can't afford a backpack to carry their items in, so they get covered in dust. And they've used like one notebook for maybe 30 or three or four subjects, so every little inch of paper was covered with writing. They didn't want to put anything to waste. And sometimes kids would even be sharing sharing notebooks, and they'd also, there'd be like one pen between three or four children. And even though a pen is probably like two or three cents, it's like to them that's a fortune, they can't afford that. And there's more important things to buy. And it was really sad, so you'd be trying to teach them, and they're trying to take notes, but I mean, they can't take notes, it makes it almost impossible, and they don't have any of the supplies that they need. Um, and this is the storage room um, that the teachers use to store all their books, and as you can tell, everything's in pretty poor conditions. This is actually, this school is actually like, considered a nicer school by Kenyan standards, um, which is pretty sad, considering that everything looks pretty tattered and, and dirty. And these are some of the textbooks the students were using, and yet again, there'd be like 10 to 15 kids per textbook, and they're, like, that's average condition. There no covers, and they're probably 10, 15 years old, so a lot of stuff they're learning is, uh, like, especially their science books, because I'm a science major, so it's like, that's wrong. We've proven that wrong, so it's oh. kind of, yeah, it's pretty, pretty bad. Um, and yeah, they'd have to run sometimes, like if I assign homework, they'd run a couple miles to their friend's house to try and share a book. And when you live in Kenya, you probably don't, I don't know, at least I didn't want to be outside very long. I was scared of lions and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, and this, this was their uh, cherished volleyball. I know it's a soccer ball, but they use it for volleyball because that's one of their favorite sports they played at the school. And it's completely tattered and they wouldn't even let me touch it. I was like, oh, I'm going to play volleyball. They're like, no. It's only for <laughs> only for very important games and so yeah the only the older kids are allowed that that ball um so yeah their balls are very expensive and they're a rare commodity so yet again i think sports are almost pretty much just as important as an education they teach you just as valuable things so i was pretty concerned about that and actually what they did to play be able to play with something for sports is they get a bunch of paper bags here you can see that green thing is a bunch of garbage bags so they tie like string around and they'd use that to kick around and play soccer with and they're happy as, as can be but if you gave that to a kid here they'd be like why are you giving me garbage so they're surprised but here it's pretty sad so I was thinking how could I make a difference in the school what could I do for these kids that would last longer than a few years or just I didn't want to just give them money because that's only going to last a few weeks. It'll buy them a couple pens, but after that, the other kids are not going to have anything still, and they're going to be back in the exact same situation where I came into. So um, I was trying to think of something to do. Um, uh, so I wanted something inexpensive that had a high profit margin so they can gain a lot of money, purchase a lot of things, for, uh, and then be at low cost. So I was thinking, what would be good for Kenya? And I thought of, why can't they sell rabbits for food? So I thought of the rabbit project, as we all know what rabbits are here in Victoria. <laughs> um, it wasn't, the side didn't involve shipping rabbits from Victoria to <laughs> Africa, but, um, but yeah, we, they use it as a food source, so I thought, why not do that? Um, 
So they multiply very quickly, as we all know, and they're very cheap to feed, only a couple of like maybe ten dollars Canadian standards there to feed quite a few rabbits. And um, the most expensive part was just building the hutch, but once we had that built, I mean it was good to go from there. Um, so this is my beautiful drawing of the hutch. Um, I just drew it out so I can figure out all the supplies that we needed so I could figure out how much money we needed to fundraise to start building. Um, and this was calculating out all the materials that uh, was needed to build the hutch. And also, um, I went into town and I went to a hard, the local hardware store and worked out a deal with them, just letting them know what I was doing so they could give me the best deal possible. And they basically told me all the prices and they gave me a lot of feedback of how to build, because I don't know how to build things. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was good. And once I got that figured out, hired a builder, and we started building the rabbit hutch. I definitely did not help with that. <laughs> I would just give him some nails and stuff like that, but uh, yeah, so that's day one, and he was very good, very cooperative, and kept building. This is day two, it's coming along, and there's day three. It's pretty much done at this point. Um, so yeah, we needed, I guess, for some rabbits to put inside the hutch. And um, what we decided to do was to have, just so all the kids, because all the kids were very excited about it, so we wanted them all to be involved in the rabbit project. Um, so we had a team initiative. So what it would be was the older kid here with two or three younger kids, and they'd all work on rotation. So the older kid would be involved in like selling the rabbits, going to market, learning the interpersonal and business skills that are necessary to sell something such as a rabbit, and then he'd work with the kids and teach them how to um, clean and care after the rabbits, and um, eventually they'd be able to learn how to sell um, the rabbits at market. And there it is, complete, completed. And so we went into town and got some food and some rabbits, and this is one of the bags that we bought, and pretty big <laughs> there, so there's all the food to uh, feed the multitude of rabbits to come, I was hoping. <laughs> and there's our first rabbit. <laughs> and we bought three of them, two females and then one male. And they also, they are, I think they're, you can sell them after about three months or so, so it's pretty fast, like once it starts going. As we all know, it doesn't stop. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this is our first rabbit. And actually a girl named Sylvia, she's, um, She's an orphan. She's had actually a very difficult, well, when I look at her, I feel sorry for her, but she seems so happy, but she's had a very hard life, and she's an orphan, and her, her mother died of AIDS. It's a typical story. Mother or father die of AIDS. The other parent abandons the family because they're just too stressed out to care for so many children. And so she grew up um, with probably 20 to 30 other kids, all orphans. And her goal is actually, it's funny because I want to be a doctor and she wants to be a doctor too and she grows up. So I thought it was really neat for her. She took total charge and helped me like organize the kids because most of them don't speak English. So it was really good to have her on board. She kind of organized everything and she's really taking this into her hands as a, as a strong leader for this project. So I'm really excited to see her progress and her success and as I'm sure she'll have in her achieving her goals. And this is the, the boy rabbit. And so yeah, basically it's a really good, it's a self-sustaining project, which is what I wanted. This will help the school for years to come, and it'll provide the money to buy the school supplies and to help funding for the um, sports equipment, everything that they obviously desperately need. And this is the future. Well, <laughs> maybe not that bad. <laughs> um, yeah, so <laughs> <Maybe. Take> on, <laughs> <everyone>. <laughs> I'm going to be the, the reason why there's so many rabbits out here. Um, so I was thinking, and maybe doing this, all, like, this is only one school in one small part of the world in Kenya. I mean, there's, all, there's so many schools in third world countries that really need, like, this is holding back education in countries where it's so hard to already get an education, let alone have everything you need for the education. So. Um, I think it would be good to do this. I really want to start doing this. Actually, I was thinking of going to Peru and starting either a rabbit farm or a guinea pig farm. And um, yeah, and just doing this in other countries and hopefully be self-sustaining for them.